let me tell you what this panel is not. This is not a panel about climate change mitigation. We're not going to talk about new ways to reduce energy, new, new ways to increase energy efficiency or to, uh, or to uh, deter emissions. Uh, that's a subject that's very important. And by the way, I'm going to, my panelists are not happy about this, so I'm going to give them a couple of minutes, just a couple of minutes, to talk about the relationship between what we're going to talk about and the classic topic of climate change mitigation. The premise of this panel, though, is that it's too late. Um, we do need, we, we damn well better uh, manage, uh, manage emissions at some point. But we are already past the point of no return in terms of the notion that we're going to, we're going to be seeing, we may already be seeing damage from climate change. Uh, uh, the areas you've, you're familiar with them, uh, we're talking species loss, more extreme weather, uh, more droughts and floods, uh, more regional crop failures, uh, and then a couple of real, of, of real rears that have barely been mentioned before. One is, one is the fact that, uh, that uh, climate change may, f may drive uh, international migration, which, especially in poor countries, which will make a mess in itself. Um, there are also the questions of disease vector changes. Uh, if it's wetter, it, it, in some places getting wetter means you're going to move, you're going to have much better vectors for, for uh, insect-borne diseases. And, um, and the same goes with transportation. In, in, in Africa and in much of Africa and Asia, they still depend on dirt roads, and if they're mud, they don't get, they don't get their crops to, to market, et cetera. Um, what I'd like to do is start this panel I think all my panels, or all my panelists, or at least some of them, want to talk a little bit before we get going about the relationship between the classic subject of mitigation, how to stop this from happening in the first place, and adaptation, which is the subject of what are we, how are we going to manage the problem with minimal uh, social economic disruption? Um, who, 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 who was so upset about this? I think it was Nat, wasn't it? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know about it. Oh, I, you know, by the yeah. way, you know, I, I do apologize. I, I really should introduce the panel very quickly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, this hour deadline and all that. Um, let's see. Um, alphabetically, but not in the order here, uh, first we have Molly McCauley. And Molly's Vice President of Research and a Senior Fellow at Resources for the Future, which you may not have heard of. It's a very low prof profile, but very influential nonpartisan environmental group that's been, that's been beavering away at research and environmental issues for a very long time. Uh, Richard Sander is just on my left. Uh, Richard uh, is a pioneer in, uh, in, in, mar in market-friendly uh, methods of, of managing uh, climate change. Uh, he's really the guy you could say in many ways who made cap and trade practical. Uh, you can read his actual ti titles in the book. Uh, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse is, a, is the Democratic Senator from Rhode Island, who among other things is a member of the Environment and Public Works, Works Committee. He's an advocate, as an outspoken advocate of market-based intervention to stem greenhouse emissions. Uh, he's one of the few, one of the lonely voices in the Senate these days who, uh, who gives proper attention to this incredibly important subject. Uh, to my, let's see, where else am I going here? Okay. Uh, I, I called on Nat, for Nat is at the far end there. Uh, Nat Kahane is Vice President for, International, for the International Climate Program at the Environmental Defense Fund, previously at Environmental Defense. Uh, EDF, by the way, uh, is the economist's favorite environmental lobby. Um, they've been working for a very long time on on cost-minimizing market-friendly solutions to environmental <coughs> problems. And they really deserve the recognition for ha having been there from the beginning. Um, and then last but not least is Michael Levy. M Michael is a senior fellow uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. He's the director of their program on, on energy security and climate change. Um, he has a new book out called Power Surge, which is an analysis of accelerating changes in energy technology, economics, and politics. OK, I've done my, I've done my bit. I'm talking too fast anyway. Uh, let me start, uh, go back to where I was with Nat. Nat, you had some things to say about the relationship between adaptation and mitigation, I believe. Well, I, just uh, from an environmental perspective, I think we used to, even five years ago, or ten, certainly 10 years ago, people saw adaptation and mitigation as really in opposition. I think. People were 
environmental community were afraid, in a sense, to talk about adaptation. There was a sense, if you talked about adaptation, then you were accepting the fact that this was happening, and you were going to undermine the will of people to, uh, to get at the root of the problem, which is greenhouse gas emissions. I think that's changed now, and one of the reasons we've seen that change is because we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. I mean, we already see it's no longer something that's already that's just going to be way in the future. Um, it's something that we see in the droughts and the wildfires and, and potentially in some aspects of the, uh, of the storms we saw uh, in where I come from in New York City of Superstorm Sandy last fall. Um, exactly how much you attribute to climate change is you know, a matter uh, of, of debate, but clearly those things are connected and are signs of a, of a warming world. And so I think that's shifted the debate. I think it's shifted the debate among people being willing to talk about adaptation and mitigation, and, and this is the last thing I, I want to point out, I think, I think it will shift the debate back around mitigation because as, uh, as people begin to see, and we see this already in some of the polling and the public opinion polls, as people begin to see the real costs associated with the impacts of climate change right in the near term, the costs of rebuilding New Jersey, uh, the shore of New Jersey and Long Island, the cost to human life and, uh, and capital, I think people will start to understand there is an enormous cost of not doing anything, so maybe we better think about what kind of cost we should incur. So they're, so to, they're to copacetic. Address. So we're not, it's not either or. It's got to be both. Anybody else want to make any point about that before we move on to the very yeah. practical issue? Okay. Uh, Molly, yeah, so please. Thanks, Peter and Nat. I agree with you. I think, um, and I'll throw something else into the mix, which mm -hmm. isn't on your agenda, okay. uh, but it's something that we might think about going forward because others are thinking about it too. We have to be smart. We, um, this is a conference that's been rich in uh, issues like debt and deficit finance and, and terrorism and, and um, faster cures for, for a healthier population worldwide. And you know, both majority leaders, we have reminded us yesterday, we, we can't do everything. <coughs> there have got to be some trade-offs. So how can we be smart about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the mitigation side of it, um, adapting? And then others are already thinking a lot about the third wheel in this, and how do we trade off among the three? Geoengineering, which is actively changing climate. In the event there are tipping points, at least the thought is do the R&D and figure out the global governance for deployment and managing at the margin our portfolio of interventions in each of these areas is a very difficult, very difficult issue for society. These are long-lived problems. You cannot see, touch, feel, or smell climate change, the mitigation part of it. And we can push it into the future, and yet a lot of it we need to start thinking about now, but we cannot do everything. Well, you'll be hearing the word geoengineering in the future. It's the third rail of climate change policy. But both of you guys wanted to say something. Uh, Richard, quickly? Yeah. Uh, can I get slide 22? I think this is kind of like the uh, Mark Twain rumors of his death are premature. Um, there's a slide of cap and trade, and if you take a look at it, uh, from California all the way to Shenzhen, to Shanghai, to India, to Brazil, the BRIC countries, to Reggie. I think rumors of the death of this instrument are overstated, number one. <laughs> number two, if we take a look at California and having taught here in the Jurassic era, <laughs> many things, good and bad, start from this state. Right now we have a cap and trade program it began January 1st. If you put up slide 24, you may be surprised to know that the carbon trading in California is bigger than lumber futures in the United States and approaching oats. It is very successful. You have big players like EDF, VTOL. You yet have restrictions by the PUC. And I think that we will be very surprised and the U.S. will follow California and to throw up something as a provocateur, I think China will teach us how to use markets. All right, I'm not going to let this go on because I, I, it, I know it's your shtick and that's a very interesting shtick, but I want to I want to no, push, I wanna push I'm for that adaptation. It's all shticked out. <laughs> I'm shticked out. Shticked I've out. done it. <laughs> uh, uh, Senator, Senator White, Whitehouse, you had something to say on this? You, you don't have I, to. I, no, I'd echo what, what Nat said. I think the adaptation discussion loops us right back to putting a price on carbon mitigation because when you see what the price of adaptation is and when you actually look seriously at ad adaptation and you look at some of the areas where you cannot adapt, you know, you, c you can build a dike around New York City, 
you can't de-acidify the Pacific Ocean. You can't cool the Narragansett Bay. Those things bring potentially dramatic changes to our species, and they're not adaptable. Well, and so I think you got to talk about adaptation, but I think, it's a dis as, as Nat said, we can't be scared of that discussion because it points us right back to the need to get something done. And I think getting something big done is actually very doable. We can talk okay. more about that. Um, okay, let me go back to the prosaic. I, I thought we'd divide the hour, hour a bit between subjects which are primarily related to uh, developed countries and, and the U.S. in particular, and then t and then save some time for uh, the, a very different set of issues related to uh, to emerging markets and and truly poor countries. Um, let's start let's start with <coughs> the issue again. What we're talking about here is how to minimize the cost of of what appears to be uh, some very serious disrupt economic, social, and uh, social disruption in the United States associated with uh, with, with, wet, with changes in weather. Start with, let's start with coastal protection. Uh, who'd like to tell me about right now what we have in place in terms of, of, what, of what, what's, what, is the, what is the protection at this point look like? Uh, One night, what? I take a step back briefly from that. First, I think when Nat said to lay out mitigation and adaptation is absolutely right. There was a study a few years back I think the title was something like avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. And that's a good way to think about this. When we look at coastal protection, uh, we, have a, you know, we have a mix of different efforts at the state level and at the federal level to you know, uh, address the rising risks of climate change. But we have a big debate over how to set up the incentives so that people privately make the decisions correctly. Uh, we have a lot of things like coastal flood insurance that incentivize people to build in vulnerable areas that then result in greater damage than we otherwise would have had. The problem with the simple solution to that, which is saying, let's take it away, is it may increase efficiency, but it at the same time can be very unfair to some of the people who are affected. And this is something that I think pervades all of our adaptation discussions. We need to think at the same time about effectiveness and about fairness, right? There are a lot of solutions for adaptation that are very cost effective on average, but are not very cost effective for certain people who get really hurt uh, by them. And so balancing those two pieces is, is extraordinarily difficult. It has to ultimately involve some mix of better incentives, but also I suspect some compensation or support for people to deal with the difficult transitions that being exposed to these incentives. Incentives is a nice uh, is a nice cold word for people feeling the pain of increasing climate change and having to react to it. Um, the politics of this, um, is there any way to get around the notion that the way we're going to deal with, with coastal vulnerability, and we're more vulnerable now than we've ever been before, I believe, because of enormous amounts of construction along, along the coasts. Um, is, there any way, is there any way to get past the politics of, after a, after a big storm, after a hurricane, uh, that uh, that w Congress will just l come up with come up with a lot of money to cover many of the many of the expenses. Is there a way well, an alternative I, to that? I don't want there to be an alternative to that. <laughs> when there is a big terrible storm, we do want resources to go to the people who are hurt to help rebuild. The problem has been, I think, that the model for that has been everything's fine. We are in steady state. And our concern about the use of the money should be that nobody takes unfair advantage to build better than they had before. So there are all sorts of restrictions on if you get FEMA emergency money, you've got to basically rebuild as before because we don't want you building something nicer on the taxpayer's nickel than you had before. And that was the dominant concern. Now we have a very different concern because we're not steady state. We're going to have more and more severe storms, and it's going to continue, and it's going to get worse. And the ocean's already 10 inches up from the 1938 hurricane uh, in the Newport tide gauge. And so the 19, whatever it is, 2038 hurricane is going to be a whole lot more damaging because it's got all that extra sea to throw at the coast in a storm surge. And we've got to be prepared for that. And the current rebuild strategy does not allow for a rebuild in light of that climate risk. And that's the biggest political change I think we have to make, is that we've got to reboot the way FEMA and other emergency agencies reply to these so that we're building back 
in a more sustainable and survivable way. We also heavily favor man-made construction over things like sand dunes and marshes and other things that the good Lord has developed over many eons to protect the shore from the sea. And when they're overrun, you accelerate the damage. And trying to get that rebuilt is, is much harder sledding than trying to get a seawall rebuilt. But is there a way ahead of time to start restructuring what the federal government will and will not do after a storm? I mean, or, or are we going to I think that's to the way to restructure. Unless you're going to walk away from people who've been clobbered by a storm and are now out in the cold, which I don't think is tenable, then you're going to go in. And the question is, when you're going to go in, what is the sense and purpose that you bring to that effort? And I think the sense and purpose you bring to that effort has to be to take the next step necessary to make sure that we can survive what is going to be increasingly worse. And should that be, does that exposure. require legislation? Uh, regulation and legislation Peter, both. can I? Please. I, I, I want to build, because I think that Senator's making a really important point. It's something I was just thinking of as well. And it's not just at the federal level, it's also at the local level, what the building codes are, right? I mean, that's encapsulated in the building codes. And I remember talking to someone recently from the New Jersey shore who said, you know, their, the building code was the highest 100-year uh, storm surge they had ever had, plus three feet. And the water from Sandy came in one or two feet above that. Now, when you rebuild, you know, the easy, so, so okay, so the building code, you know, the council or whatever got together and they said, okay, now it's going to be Sandy plus a foot. Well, we've got to get ahead of this. I mean, as, as the senator said, this is not, we're not in a steady state anymore. And we can't say, well, okay, now, San well, now the, the high water mark literally was Sandy. So let's set the code there. We've got to be in a different world of anticipating the changes we're going to see. And I think as we do that, that's going to be pretty scary. But that, that kind of dynamism has to be incorporated into everything from the, what we do at the federal level to the building codes at the local level. Michael? So this creates a big physical science challenge. In the mitigation world, what you really want to know is whether there's a big risk, um, whether there's a reasonable, po reasonable possibility that things could turn out very badly. And then you know you want to reduce emissions to protect against that. In order to adapt, you actually need better foresight on what the impacts of climate change will be. You need better foresight in time, you need better res resolution in time, you need better resolution in space. We're very bad at taking these, uh, we're very bad, we're not particularly good at taking these global projections and downscaling them to a level where you can actually use them to inform whether it's local, state, or federal government decisions or to inform private decisions, right? Private actors respond to incentives, but if they don't know what the incentives are, if they don't know what the challenges they'll face are, uh, they can't respond to those. So this is one area where we need to do a lot more in order to empower whichever player it is to actually you know, prepare for those challenges down the road. And the better we know that stuff, presumably, the, the better the politics of Mitigation, mitigation yes. will be too. To a good extent. Uh, they're, they're not exactly the same things. If you have a limited pot of money and you want to invest in understanding what you need to know to support mitigation, it wouldn't be quite the same as what you would invest for adaptation, in particular this uh, small spatial scale piece of the equation is really important for the adaptation side of things. Gotcha. Molly, you had something to do. Yeah. I think the discussion is we need to know what we're adapting to in order to adapt wisely is really critical and it does, it is one of these difficult individual and public policy decisions that is so heavily dependent on the science and the science that can be relevant to the decision making at a point in time. But a lot of these are longer run effects, especially in the United States. Much of us, it's not yet fully apparent what is happening aside from these extreme events. That said, this does tie back to what Richard began with, which is when we think about what are our most flexible mechanisms to begin to true up decisions as we get more information, the science side, it's whatever the price-like devices we have, whatever kinds of creative financial market-like devices we can, those enable us to very quickly ramp up or down in managing against critical things, scarcity, et cetera. The problem is, for so much of our natural resource management, we do not have good prices. We do not price water well in this country. Our energy prices are not very good, as Michael shows in his new book. Um, managing land use, it's just fraught with all kinds of perverse historical difficulties. So our natural resource management, fundamentally with the economic side of it, we're not well positioned right now to respond. But with creative things like what Richard and others do, not as well, we can get there. 
Well, yes, please. Yeah, I have a, a different kind of worry, and it, it's the same thing. <coughs> we started getting in the catastrophic bond area and catastrophic mm -hmm. options, and well, could you, you know, could you give the audience a twenty second explanation of what a catastrophic bond is? Yeah, it's a bond that's triggered by a parametric. Uh, a category five storm, a tornado of X amount, and it pays off parametrically. It's not a contract for indemnity. So we take a look at an insurance industry today, and I got, a, Peter got involved in the business, and, and in 1988, Hurricane Hugo happened, and I was told that was a one in a hundred year event. That was followed by Andrew, that was another one in a hundred year event. Loma Pieta earthquake was another one on 100, Sandy, Katrina, Fukushima. Every two years in the insurance business, there's a one in a 100 year event, okay? Now, the primary surplus in the insurance industry is $550 million. Billion? Billion. Or billion? billion. And I would ask all of you to think, given Sandy, given Irene, Given the other risks, if you couldn't wipe out the entire insurance industry at one event, and I think as the senator said, there's no way that a governor is going to not make the people good, which means we're setting up for a banking type system because insurance companies have a free put. They can give the company to the government. <laughs> and if we were involved and wanted to go in business, we'd go in the riskiest place, pump in a little amount of capital, write the highest premiums. If we last for five years, we become rich. If not, it becomes federalized and mutualized. So I think the issue that we have to work on sooner rather than later is building up the capital because I fall, I'm, I got grandkids, I really think this is for real. I think 550 billion is nothing. And you could have a trillion dollar problem like the banking system, it would royal the bond markets, it would royal the equity markets, it would come at social stress. It's all priced wrong, as Molly mm -hmm. said. We don't price mm -hmm. insurance right. They get mm -hmm. subsidized for going into high risk areas. And I just hope, that all of you might use this as food for thought and ask yourselves, is 500 billion for a $16 trillion economy to cover all of the property and all of the casualties that exist? And don't we have a situation in insurance just like we had with the banking system? You really set us up for. I mean, this is a very this is a very important topic. I, mean, are, I think so. <laughs> are we are we foolish to even be thinking about trying to privatize the markets for uh, for uh, for for risk management with climate change? Is this is this an area where it's so full of ish, of issues of moral hazard that we might be better off not beginning? Peter, it's such a badly organized market because you have extremely low rates. This is what's called a soft property market. You can buy insurance at, at levels, and I think the government has got to come in, increase capital requirements, encourage catastrophe-issued bonds, catastrophe, and there's exchanges in Bermuda which you're trading them. We've got to say we need to look at the insurance industry. If we talk about adaptation, number one is adapt the financial system mm -hmm. so we don't have a, a great recession on our hands comes a billion dollars. And Irene just would have had to go a little way, Sandy turned right for 40 miles, Katrina hit the wrong part in New Orleans. I mean, these are all half a... $500 billion events, and, and I would hope that the policymakers would say, how do we ring fence the liabilities associated with cat catastrophic risk, and how do we build the capital requirements that are necessary so that we don't have a financial collapse that accompanies a catastrophic event? So 
Please. So I think Richard's bringing up a really important challenge, and we went through this challenge about 10 years ago. It was called terrorism insurance and reinsurance. Yeah. And uh, there was a fear among policymakers that you could do exactly what Richard describes. You can come in, you can charge wonderful premiums. If there's no big event, you collect the premiums and you're happy. If there's a big event, you're done anyhow, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, or the government absorbs you, and so you're done as a shareholder at least. Uh, and what we did for the most part there is and the government backstops things and says, look, private insurance is allowed to insure up to a certain level. But beyond that, you can't because you're basically playing people for suckers. And the government's going to be there beyond that point. Now, is that the right model here? And if it is, where is that line drawn? I'm not sure. But at a, at a minimum, there should be some lessons to be learned from that experience. Yeah, I, I agree. There you have a different problem. And I, I, you have to applaud Washington because there was a time then they said, let's have terror derivatives. And, and that's a very frightening concept. They're terrorizing enough. Uh, <laughs> we don't need a derivative because it's, the moral hazard is there. And so terrorism becomes a very yes. different sort of animal. But I think nobody controls catastrophic risk. And we just have to, you know, it slipped under the radar and, and we're just not focusing on it. I think we're all saying the same thing. I'm just bringing or hope you will think about what has to be adapted in financial institutions and new regulations as a result of 70% of the United States living in high risk earthquake, tornado, and hurricane areas. And let's think about what has to be adapted in not just financial institutions, but political institutions as well. Mm -hmm. If you are an American exceptionalist, if you believe that the experiment that the founders set up has something to teach the rest of the world and has been of value to the rest of the world, if you feel, as Daniel Webster said, that they set before the world an example of liberty, and if the experience of that example didn't measure up, it would be the death knell of liberty around the world, that we really offer something special as Americans. We've got this totally screwed up at home politically, which embarrasses our entire political system and democracy in the eyes of the world in Bangladesh when it's flooded, in India when it's flooded, when the big rice growing deltas of Vietnam are inundated with salt water, when there are international calamities, it's not just American calamities, when there are international calamities and more than half of the carbon up in the sky is <coughs> ours and we have not dealt with this in a responsible way as an American democracy, that's not the experience of our example of liberty that I want other people to see and I think it risks really compromising our ability to lead in this world and not just be the focus of immense international fury and resentment. It, that it, changes a lot of things that we don't even think right. of right now. Is there any inclination Very in Congress important. to think about adaptation alongside mitigation? Is there, I mean, for example, to regulate insurance that, or to, to integrate insurance and disaster relief, private insurance with the disaster relief. Is this so far from the, so far from the agenda that it's almost pointless to talk about? We're kind of down in the details on this. You've got to remember that the discussion in Congress at this point is that uh, no Republican will enunciate the words climate change. <laughs> if they do, the harpies of the right come down upon them and lash them until they come back to orthodoxy. We've been told in the Environment and Public Works Committee that if we put the words climate change in a bill, the Republicans will be against it. So the state of the discussion in Washington on this subject is somewhere between non-existent and primitive. And so getting on down into kind of details about how you fix things is uh, a little bit beyond where well, we are the, right now. The best we can hope for, go ahead, Nat. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to go out on a limb with respect to, to some of the politics. First, I, I, I can't, we can't be talking about coastal protection and the difficulties of recognizing that without mentioning the contributions of the legislature of the state of North Carolina, which by fiat said, you, you, you know, you can't, you can't, nobody can say anything about sea level rise being more than three feet or something, simply because that's going to, you know, the state legislature of North Carolina is declaring that that's so. So whether or not there are scientists that are Led saying Led by the example of King Canute. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but, but, but actually I do see a glimmer of, 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 of positive uh, hope here, perhaps, which is, you know, the mitigation debate on the politics, right? The mitigation debate has become one about what is needed to do to change our energy system, and it's, it's, it's a fairly large 
potentially intervention of, I mean, people like me are for it, but potentially it looks to some people like a very large intervention of the state, even if there are ways to do it, like Richard was talking about, that are, that are, that are pretty light touch and that are market-based and so on. But I think a discussion that starts in adaptation potentially is a discussion that starts with how do we protect and preserve the ecosystems that we already have, the coastlines that we have, um, how do we preserve uh, the, the planet that we were given in, in seeing that it's changing uh, uh, as a result of our actions. And that, I, I, it'd be interesting to see whether the politics of that are different because it starts from a different place and a different set of, of values. And, and perhaps I'm being overly optimistic, but I think maybe that's a route back to a more a saner uh, national conversation in that, that I, I think you're hitting a, a point in the head, and I know it's your field of competence. We're living in an energy pricing system where everything depends on New York Harbor. And when that price changes and all of the refineries are in low, you know, places, sea level, and we've got to look at changing the grid, we've got to look at gas, we've got to look at loads of things so you don't have these massive blackouts. The whole energy infrastructure is not priced for a catastrophic event. And that, just to f close that loop here, what do we have to do to price it for that? How would you begin to price it appropriately? Well, if, for the first thing I, I would take a look at is I would like, love to see Congress do what it did with uh, natural gas and make electricity a FERC function, and you could build $75, $100 billion of capital flowing into it, new jobs, change the whole infrastructure that allows interstate electricity and our poles above board, that could be done in one page. All you have to do is say we are going to treat electricity as if it was natural gas. We did it in 92. Now you have to fight with the public utility commissions. Everybody wants their own thing. But there's 10 easy fixes that could generate hundreds of thousands of jobs. And you know, you talk to the, the guys in Congress, or I have, like Jeff Bingaman before he retired, everybody says, yes, that's the right idea. It just can't get done, and it's maddening. Anybody want to make a, a last put on that? I would like to move a bit on to what, what, what we're going to do in the developing world, or, or not do in the developing world. Anybody have a last point on this? No? Okay, then let me move on. Um, there, <coughs> It's, it's, a, it's conventional wisdom and quite reasonable, I think, that the richer the country is, the more capable it is of managing, its, of managing the risks associated with, with climate change, uh, one way or another. The poorer you are, the less likely. Uh, to that end, of course, the, the parts of the world that are poor are neither contributing much to global warming in terms of emissions, but have little, or little capacity to manage the changes in in weather that are gonna, gonna follow from it. Um, recognizing that, there are a few little, almost symbolic sized funds that have been set up to, uh, to fund projects to ad for adaptation in poor countries. Uh, the, the World Bank has, has one, it's a couple. The UN has one. I believe naturally the, naturally the Scandinavian aid, aid organizations have one. They, they're always first. Uh, but this is going to be a huge problem. I think we can all agree. A huge problem. Is there, can we imagine how we would want to scale up assistance to countries that are plainly cannot, cannot, cannot manage these problems themselves? Uh, Nat? So I'll, I'll just make a, a couple of quick points. One is um, that adaptation, I think we, if we're going to deal with it effectively in the developing world, uh, we, we, we can't think of it as a separate fund. So there's this development aid over here, and then there are separate funds for adaptation over here, and you know, we'll, we'll treat those as entirely separate for a couple of reasons. One being because if you're promoting development uh, aid, uh, if you're building infrastructure, roads, you know, bridges, and so on, uh, and you're not taking account of climate change, then you're making that obsolete before it's even complete. Um, right, a, a, an example, not one that was necessarily funded by development banks, but an example being the, the Chinese uh, uh, railway across the, what is it, the, the um, 
the frozen reaches of Tibet, which is already sort of sinking as the, as the land underneath it begins to warm. Um, <laughs> so I think you need to incorporate adaptation into development financing. Uh, I know the World Bank is starting to think about this, is, is well along in thinking about this. Um, and, you know, as, especially as we start to transition away from uh, some of the more pressing needs, I, I guess the, the number of countries, for example, in the IDA, uh, the, low, the, the poorest of the poor countries that the bank uh, supports, that number of countries is actually starting to drop. The number of eligible countries is shrinking. Um, can we think about replacing, uh, redirecting some of those funds that would have gone to IDA countries and focusing them on adaptation but in the context of overall development aid? I think there are some things you can, you can do to keep the overall stream going but make sure it's deployed in a smarter way. So, uh, Molly, Molly, your sure. turn. Sure, um, I'll be quick, Michael, so don't forget your thought. Um, you know, um, Nobel laureate in economics Tom Schelling spoke at Resources for the Future a number of years ago, and he uh, was very prescient. He said exactly what you said. He said, you know, when, when we think about adaptation related to climate issues in developing countries, it, it really just boils down to another type of foreign aid and foreign lending, and all the difficulties there. Um, in that, without the climate being an additional impetus for, for intervention. That's a very complicated area for the United States. Again, there are these critical trade-offs in a time of fiscal stress. Um, that said, uh, at yesterday's sessions for the Milken Conference, there was a lot of discussion changing from the BRICS countries to the MIPS countries. And I thought, regardless of where we're thinking the action is going to be, there's an overlap an intersection with these countries and the effect of these environmental and climate effects on them. So this is the totality of, of the financial sector and the lending. And then we might also, I noticed, Peter, you didn't assemble on your panel anyone from the corporate sector, but I do know that especially multinational companies or those who rely on other countries for part of their supply chain, um, they're beginning to think about this because they need a productive, healthy, working labor force. <coughs> they need factories that are well situated and not subject to extreme events. So they're beginning to take action. NGOs are beginning to take action. And we need to think a little clearly about relative roles of government, the corporate okay. sector, and the private sector and NGOs as we move forward here. Uh, I think you want to speak to that point too, actually. Right. I had my own uh, Tom Schelling observation to share with, with people. Uh, Tom points out that there are somewhere between a billion and two billion people in the world who live on less than a couple dollars a day. If their incomes are cut in half, it doesn't even show up in our estimates of global impacts of climate change as a fraction of a percent of right. GDP, but it's extraordinarily, mm -hmm. uh, it, it hits them in extraordinary mm -hmm. ways and we do need to deal with it. I think Nat is right to say we need to think about how we integrate uh, climate change into our mainstream development thinking, but I think there are a couple places where it is useful to at least separate some of it out. Uh, and <coughs> one goes back to something that Senator Whitehouse said: when something, when there's a big flood in Bangladesh or a catastrophic drought in a part of Africa, and people hear that the United States has been pumping this carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere, and it is intensifying these problems that they have that has really bad consequences for the United States strategically, setting aside the moral part of it, which is extraordinarily important. Just on the strategic front, that is a problem. And to the extent that the United States can explicitly show that it's doing something to help deal with those impacts, I think that has value more broadly for our relationships with these countries and with their people. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, when we head into international climate negotiations, uh, it turns out that one of the most powerful ways to bring a large fraction of negotiators around and the world's countries around is to pledge money toward helping with adaptation. Um, again, difficult to mobilize, difficult to use effectively, and often the promises aren't actually met. But as a very practical matter of diplomacy and negotiation, uh, some money directed specifically toward ad adaptation can have a lot of leverage. And if that actually helps you get to somewhere where countries are willing to sign up for cutting emissions, then it does have real, it does have real benefits. Uh, Senator, is it, isn't it plausible that, that uh, unlike foreign aid, that effect, what amounts to disaster relief uh, is a, in the third world is a, better, is a better sell for Congress? I think, yeah, because there's a human instinct that everybody has to try to offer help in a, in a crisis. The problem is when those crises become so frequent and so dramatic uh, 
that the financial toll of them begins to mount up and people begin to be very sensitive about that, then you have the isolationist discussion all over again in this context, and we have some very isolationist folk in uh, Congress right now, and they get kind of mobilized around this, and off you go to the races. You can see how, particularly if we're dealing with the kind of numbers Richard's talking about, you get in over your head pretty quickly. So, I mean, I would take it then you're quite pessimistic that the U.S. will be a Will, will, will be a significant contributor to to um, to, to meaningful adaptation. No, I think I think we will be a significant contributor, and I think we need to be. My worry is that we'll be increasing our contribution along this kind of a slope, mm -hmm. and the damage that will come is going to go at that kind of a slope. <laughs> and there comes a point where you yes. simply can't keep up. I mean. What's the highest point in Bangladesh? Four feet above sea level? <laughs> I mean, that country is going to be inundated, and that whole population is going to have to push out into India and Burma and displace the local people there and move into their farms. And it's, that becomes, you know, you've got some very, very big problems that you can't throw enough money at to solve them. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a good seg into that issue of migration. Uh, presumably, we're, we're looking at levels of economic and social disruption that will push populations across borders. Have any, by the way, let me, let me ask the environmental defense people, have you, have you guys done any of work on this area of what, what, what we can expect in terms of migration? No, I mean, there, there are some groups that do much more work on, on adaptation uh, and on, and on the Im, th those sorts of impacts, and I, and I know that there's many folks who have done it on, uh, on security issues as well. I, I guess the one thing that comes to my mind that, to mention on, on this topic uh, it, and this is increasingly an issue in the international negotiations. Mike, you may know something about it. Um, is that it's it's not just okay? You know, I mean, you look at Bangladesh, and Bangladesh is going to be inundated, and you know, many people may have to move uh, upland or to other neighboring countries. But there are small island states in the Pacific that will be completely destroyed. I mean, they will just be you know they're low enough to the ground um, that uh, to to the water rather that they'll be uh, under modest sea rise projections, those small island states will disappear. And there's a set of fascinating legal questions. I'm not a lawyer, but there's some fascinating legal questions. Of what, is, what does it mean if the state, if the territory, you know, the archipelago disappears and those people go, are they still a, are they a stateless people? Do they still have a state? Do they have, do they get recognized in uh, UN uh, forums and so on? Uh, these are entirely novel legal questions that are being raised by the fact that we're we're raising our oceans. And realistically, we're, we are past the point of no return. Some of those islands are going to go, right? I mean, that it's almost certain now. That uh, certainly, I think the, the lowest lying ones. Yeah. Uh, Let me pick up on the migration question. Mm -hmm. I, I remember sitting down a year or two ago with some top scholars on climate change who were starting to look at migration. And they elaborated a whole host of things they wanted to look at. And I said, well, how are you going to distinguish the migration due to climate change from regular migration patterns? What is your scheme for this? And, they said, well, this is going to be really difficult because we don't actually have good numbers on migration to start with. Okay, so when we talk about how climate change will affect migration, how we handle it, we don't even have a starting point of migration without climate change. It's a first basic problem. Um, this gets us back, and I don't want to flog a dead, dead horse, but this gets us back to this information question. We can't respond to developments if we don't understand what those developments, not will be, but even might be. And we have very poor understanding on that. Uh, the impacts of climate change will be different uh, in different parts of particular countries. Uh, that will help drive migration, and we need to get smart on that. One, I think, bright point on that front is work that the Defense Department has supported mm -hmm. in universities. Mm -hmm. So under the Minerva program, which was set up, uh, I believe, by Secretary Gates several years ago to bring more social science work to bear on security issues, uh, they funded a seven, five or seven million dollar program at the University of Texas at Austin to look at Africa and to really get a sense of how climate change would affect uh, different populations and particularly drive security, uh, security challenges. Uh, and if you want to look at security challenges, you look at things like migration. Uh, because they're funding it at a university, we get a lot of public information out of that. That can be useful for people to plan not just for security responses, but for other responses too. Uh, I hope we'll do more of that sort of thing uh, in order to inform our response. I think where um, 
looking at only half the picture, and I think what the senator said is right, you know, Bangladesh, okay, 150 million people in uh, geography the size of New York State, all below sea level. I worry, though, all of this, this stuff on coastals, I'm not sure desertification isn't a bigger problem than all of the sea rises. If you go to China and really have conversations as a hypothesis, I think a debate worth having is Tibet about religion or is Tibet about water, okay? This is a really interesting discussion. Where do the headwaters come? Where do we go? If you take a look at the water problems potentially in India and China, and imagine glacial melts that destroy the water, not the flooding aspect of it. Try 500 million people. And water, conflict resolution in water is with guns, okay? It is, it is basically a fighting issue, you know? It, it's Mark Twain, you know, is, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. And you, we have a serious, issue here on a commodity for which there is no substitute, and it's our very lives. So I think all of us in this field who care about the environment have to focus as much on desertification as we do on ocean levels. And just to add to that, think about the security issues between Pakistan yes. and India, which, which do share those same sources of water from the Himalayas, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, now, I just, I think Richard's making a really important point. I think water, if you're looking for a, if you're looking for a change, a, 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 a change driven by climate change that could really spark security issues, conflict, so on, it's, it has to do with water. Water is such an important issue, uh, so obviously such an important resource and one that is born to drive conflict because of the head, you know, people in the headwaters versus the tailwaters. And you, I mean, you see, it goes back again to this issue of information. I mean, you see in the U.S., obviously we're not going to have war break out between, you know, Colorado and Arizona, but the, the Western River compacts have all been based on historic patterns mm -hmm. of water flows that no longer apply and are not going to apply going into the future. It's the same problem we were talking about with the sea level rise. How do you anticipate those? Because otherwise the agreements that have been built up around, oh, well, we had this much flow between, you know, 1930 and 1960, those, you just throw them out the window, but it's, it's a recipe for real conflict. Dad, I want to hit something sure. because I, I do have a little bit of difference. Uh, you and I share so many things, but uh, I taught at Berkeley in the 60s, and, um, and we were kind of concerned about the environment. And we, a number of us on the faculty, felt very strong that we shouldn't be shipping Northern California water <laughs> to Southern California. Um, and we lost that battle. Um, and we recently did a study for a foundation in Chicago, and it's not at all clear if you do the numbers that Texas, the West, will have far more political power than the Middle West, and you could put a huge straw in the Great Lakes and just push them out any place, and who knows what the ecosystem are. And all you have to do, if it follows California, is just follow the population and the political power, and you could move. I mean, it happened here in California, and I worry about that a little, because I think takings... Well, this is very interesting. You're essentially arguing that the, the, that the, that the conflict over water and desertification, it may be every bit as serious as the as yes. coastal yes. as coastal issues. Yes. As a hypothesis, I think that we have to not forget that that there's a whole, you know, there's 130 million people between Denver and, and Pittsburgh, that heartland, it's 20% of the fresh water. There's the Himalayas and Tibet that's got all of the headwaters to I China and to India and to Pakistan and places where there are nuclear weapons, you know, we should think the hypothesis is please move the desertification discussion at least on a higher plane so it isn't always coastal flooding. 
I, w <coughs> I was the attorney general of my state, and we used to meet as the National Association of Attorneys General to talk about issues. Then there was a separate group called CWAG, the Council of Western Attorney Generals. <laughs> and they met just by themselves just to fight about water. <laughs> <laughs> and so nobody else went because I, have no, I had no interest. And they would go off and they'd have their fights about water. And so it's actually there right now. It's on very slow burn because we are in a relatively steady state and the, some of the basic parameters have been worked out. But it could flare up very quickly. And that is sort of where the fight is right now. It's just being, it's just kind of low profile, low key, constantly being worked out. So, so I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, please. I mean, so this raises two kinds of interventions that you need to think about, right? Well, uh, setting aside climate mitigation. One is, can you come up with governance schemes, particularly internationally, that allow people to equitably share water? And the track record seems to suggest that when it's an easy problem, you can do it, but when it's tough, whoever's upstream uh, does substantially better than the folks downstream. Unless they the, have more guns downstream. Right, that's, exa that's exactly right. And in, and in Asia, it turns out that you generally have more guns upstream, so you're less likely to have that kind of conflict, whether it's China and Southeast Asian mm -hmm. countries or China and India. The second is, can you help people, farmers, others cope with having less water downstream? You can't completely offset uh, lower water flows, but you can put more effort into spurring development of crops that require less water, or that uh, are able to respond to different seasonal patterns of water because you have different melt in the glaciers. Uh, and that's an area where uh, the match between the places where this development and change needs to happen and the places that have the technical capacity to actually drive innovation is really bad. I mean, you're talking often about very poor countries that don't have that technological capacity. And that's a space, again, where I don't think you necessarily need a you know, big institution to hand out money in these places. You do need uh, support for research and applied research uh, in the field on things like drought resistant crops. I'm glad you raised that because, you know, with the, techno the word technology, I think this is the first time it's come up in the discussion. Um, it, it may, may that be the, the lowest hanging fruit around here that is, that is try trying to <coughs> subsidize technological innovation that, 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 uh, that, that makes adaptation easier? I don't know if it's the lowest hanging fruit. I don't think we're particularly good at measuring how effective these sorts of interventions are, particularly, again, where you're trying to develop a technology, let's say here, that you apply in a place where, again, the markets are screwed up and uh, the incentives are a problem and intellectual property protection isn't fantastic. So I don't know if it's the lowest hanging fruit, but it's certainly a place where our capabilities are a good match for the challenge and where some of the institutional uh, barriers may not be as large as in other areas. Now, I, I would characterize it, I'm, and I'm glad Mike brought up uh, food and agriculture, because that's, you know, if we, we've talked about coasts, we've talked about water per se, and obviously water brings in the connection to, to food and agriculture, and I think that's going to be another really major area where countries, in particular in the developing world, have to adapt. Um, and I think the key, the key issue there is resilience, which is also a word we haven't brought up, we, we, we haven't brought up but I think is increasingly how people are thinking about this, and, and, and Mike referred to how do, you, how do you make sure that the agricultural techniques that people are using, the crops they're using, and so on, are resilient to change. In terms of technology, I would say it's not so much technological innovation, it's the dissemination of the knowledge we have. So how do we take, you know, imagine a matrix of you know, you've got different cropping patterns and then you have different types of so soil types and you know, places, uh, land types on the spectrum from savanna to forest. Um, we know enough now to start matching what agricultural practices can get, you know, people talk about the triple win, can increase agricultural productivity and farmer incomes, can make uh, ag agriculture more resilient to climate and can reduce some of the environmental impacts we see like direct emissions. And getting, identifying what those practices are, we already have those practices, identifying those, disseminating that knowledge. You do need new institutions, you do need, you need to align the funding, the development aid with those practices and continuing to improve our, 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 inf our, our knowledge that and our we, understanding. We, we it's, need it's, to, it's, it's, that's really dissemination is the challenge. There's a real issue here which I think we also have to think about. We have international water markets, okay? They exist today. We trade water. We don't call it water trading. We call it grain trading, okay? so. Oh. 
150 <laughs> bushels of, you know, gallons for a bushel of corn, 500 gallons for a chicken, and 2,000 gallons for a steak. And we are seeing absurd sorts of things where countries that are short water are exporting their water, like Egypt and Australia and things like that. There has to be an educational effort and food security for these nations so they don't grow crops that no longer are driven by surface water, but they're eating up the aquifer, you know. Australia learned it <clears throat> the tough way. You know, these cattle that go out, that's your water, you know. And I think <laughs> we, we need to really stop, you know, and look at the fundamental economics and say, wait a second, let's take a water balance sheet, okay, and consider what you're long and what you're short, and let's see if you're exporting it. You know, maybe flowers would be a re better idea. Maybe California shouldn't be growing cotton, okay, <laughs> or Arizona. I mean, these are just incredible uses of water, and I think we need to start with nations looking at their balance sheets of water to face desertification and saying, okay, What's our public policy? So we're, we're putting all of this money into getting food self-sufficiency when the delivery of stocks or something like that would be far better than exporting your water. So I think that we need to start on an educational level to, to look at this commodity. So kangaroo steaks for Australia. <laughs> yes. Excellent idea. Mm -hmm. Molly, I think you, you've been itching there. <clears throat> yeah, I think that from ranging from innovation and technological change and like in any other sphere of, of policy issue where we have innovative new techniques of doing something, are we doing enough R&D on those? At what point do we deploy them? Who underwrites the deployment and the education and training? And on the critical role of natural resources such as water in Richard's beautiful example, you know, the question does come back, Peter, how much, you know, in these markets when there are extreme events and short-term very rapid spikes, markets kind of do respond in those cases. But Adaptation also includes an anticipating that which may happen in the longer run and the relative frequency of extreme events. And we're not very good as a society anywhere to build in that long-term capacity to think ahead. Futures markets are probably the closest we come, or 30-year mortgages. But beyond that, we're not very good at discounting the future and bringing it into the present for our decision making. Climate is one of the canonical examples of that. Could I, oh, sorry, please. Just very quickly on this question of getting technology sort of from the lab, matching it up. Uh, Molly yeah. and Nat have both talked about. It. I mean, that actually requires institutions, and you have to make sure that they exist in the on the ground in places where they're going to have an impact. I remember driving past the. the we have uh, a several dozen a network of several dozen institutes around the world for technology transfer on food. Uh, there's one focused on dry areas. I remember driving past it mm -hmm. a few years ago. Unfortunately, I was driving between uh, Damascus and Aleppo in Syria at the time. <laughs> and uh, the upshot of that is that this is not a very useful center anymore. Uh, so we need to actually make sure we have these institutions on the ground. It's sort of mundane, but if they go down, we don't have very good mechanisms for making this exchange happen. Any last words? I will have one if none of you do. It's uh, your prerogative. Pardon? It's your prerogative. Well, I guess it's my prerogative. <laughs> well, I, I take from this conversation I gotta say, a fair amount of pessimism, um, but also a lot, a lot of sense that that there's a lot of homework to be done here. Um, that we don't know what we're facing. We know we're facing something pretty bad. We, but we don't understand it very well. And it's and we're fla and we would be flailing now if we thought we could come up with solutions. Uh, also, that a discussion like this only again points back to the fact that the best thing on earth we could do is slow or stop uh, global warming because many of these problems are intractable and, and may never be solved and uh, we've, we're, really, we're really in a mess if we don't, if we don't manage global warming to begin with. Um, and to Molly's point about long time frames, we've been homo sapiens on this planet for about 200,000 years thereabouts. For that whole time period and for 600,000 years before, <laughs> 
We've been in 170 to 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Our entire human experiment has existed within that bandwidth. And for the first time ever, we are outside of it, outside of it by a lot, cresting 400 and climbing. And so, you know, Rumsfeld of all, used to talk about the uh, known unknowns mm -hmm. and the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. We're in a place where we need to be looking out for unknown unknowns. And that, that's even worse than trying to look out beyond 30 years. But these are changes that are unprecedented and they're things that drive both the temperature of the atmosphere and the acidity of the oceans. We kind of depend on our acidity, our, on our oceans and our atmosphere. So we're, we're playing for high stakes here. Well, on that note, um, that you can cheerfully wander off, and uh, <laughs> but I, I want to thank I want to thank the panel. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>